There used to be a show on TV, and you, you have to go back a ways if, uh, if you remember this. It was entitled The Love Connection. That's where I got the title for this class, The Love Connection. And it was a kind of a version of the dating game. If you, if you remember this show, what they would do is uh, you know, they'd bring a girl on, you know, a single girl, and they'd bring four or five guys out, and she would question each of them and give them you know, some questions and try to find out about them and they got her to pick one of them to go out on a date. And then the following week she'd come back and he'd come back and they'd talk about you know, the date, how well it went or how badly it went, you know, that type of thing. And that's where they got the, the comedy. Some of them got along and some of them did not get along. Of course, nowadays we have progressed to programs like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, never mind choosing among three or four, you choose among 30 or 40. And of course the, uh, the interaction between the two uh, probably would not have been permitted on television back in the day when they were doing the love connection. Let's put it that way. You, know, they, they wouldn't, you wouldn't be allowed to put the things that they do now on TV uh, back then. And of course with the, uh, with the internet, you know, that's a whole new game. We've gone further than these kind of quaint TV shows to any number of dating or matchmaking websites that promise, you know, they promise you basically you're going to find the right, the right partner. And these services, you know, they try to match people based on a couple of different uh, areas. Uh, I say this and I don't mean to be cynical, but looks comes first, you know. Looks come first. Why? Because they don't send you, they don't send you a, uh, a printed version or a printed description of the individual. Has a nice personality, good person. You know, they send you a picture. You want to see the picture before you actually read the bio. So looks is first. Activities, you know, things that you like to do. Needs, character is in there as well. And usually in these type of things people find a person who looks and acts like they want or they have the kind of needs that they feel they can deal with. But these type of you know, matchmaking things, they don't, they don't always end up in a loving relationship because good looks and uh, similar activities and needs and character, these type of things you know, don't equal love nor are they the same thing as love. A lot of people think, well, if, if his needs and my needs match and you know, I like the way they look and, you know, and uh, he's got the type of character I can deal with and so forth, that equals love and it doesn't. It doesn't equal love, not necessarily. Now, I don't usually quote Ann Landers. Again, a lot of younger people don't know who she is, but you know, she's a columnist, had a column for a long, long time. I don't usually quote her but she had an article long ago describing the difference between love and infatuation. And I, I, I want to read just part of it as an example to show that people are confused many times when it comes to love. In the article entitled Love or Infatuation, and I've printed the entire article on your notes there so you could read it for yourself later on. She says, infatuation is instant desire. It is, um, uh, one set of glands calling to another. Love is friendship that has caught fire. It takes root and it grows one day at a time. Now in this lesson, I want to talk about the foundation of every marriage, and that is love. And we're going to see that love is more than just a, a set of glands you know, calling to each other. It's more than just looks or activities or needs that are combined. So, you know, um, the title of this series is In Love for Life. And there's a reason that I chose that title for the series, In Love for Life, because marriage was designed by God to last a lifetime, right? We agree on that as Christians. That's what the Bible teaches. One man, one woman, you know, is designed that way for a lifetime. And my thought is if God gave us marriage to last a lifetime, then He's also given us the ability to love one another for a lifetime as well. And the key is to find how do we maintain that love for one another for a lifetime? Because that's the only way you know, we can remain married for a lifetime. 
Um, this series explores how to keep that love going for an entire lifetime. And it's not, it's not an easy thing. It's a challenge. It is a challenge. So I want to begin by talking about romantic myth and how this, uh, this has developed. Um, you know, sexual attraction has been around since Adam and Eve, but not the westernized idea of romance that has been popularized by books and movies in our Western culture. You know, Mr. Wright comes along and he sweeps you off your feet. Or there's one person in the world, you know, one soulmate, and what you have to do is find that soulmate. And when you find that soulmate, boy, you know, the, everything, the stars are aligned. But history has a different story about romance. Until the Middle Ages, marriages were mainly organized by families and they were strictly supervised. I mean, this was a universal custom. It wasn't just a custom among some people, it was a universal custom. Marriages were arranged. You know, Abraham, for example, arranging Isaac's marriage was not the exception, it was the rule. And for uh, up until several hundred years ago, uh, organized and formalized and arranged marriages were the rule. And then French, so it would have to be the French, right? French songwriters began to produce ballads that introduced the idealistic, romantic, dramatic idea of love, you know, love at first sight your heart beating all of a sudden. And they wrote these ballads and these poems to entertain French nobility, the lords and the ladies of the royal court in France. Now, these songs were radical at the time, just like you know, rock and roll was radical, and then punk rock was radical, you know, radical ideas. Well, these songs were like radical ideas, radical introductions into the thinking of that time, into that culture. And it was a departure from the customary way of contracting marriages based on the ability to provide the uh, family background, the agreement of beliefs, and so on and so forth. That was the way things were done. And all of a sudden, these songs were talking about love at first sight and escape and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying there were not impulse elopements or adultery, but these were the exceptions, not the, not the rule at the time. Arranged marriages were the way that things were done, and you know what? It worked. It worked. And so the heroes of these stories and songs were always brave and beautiful and chivalrous, now at the time, common people were not thought capable of the same kind of emotions. So love stories were always a monopoly of the um, aristocracy. Okay? And so the culture of romance was really for the rich, for the royalty, because they felt that common people, the peasants, they didn't have the ability to have these kinds of feelings. Well, along comes the French Revolution. Uh-oh. Along comes the French Revolution and the nobility in France fell, right? But here's the, here's the thing. The stories remained and they were passed on to the masses and they spread throughout Europe. So they went from the nobility to mass marketing. Until that time, believe it or not, falling in love with all the emotional stress and strain, was considered an unfortunate experience. Oh no, she's in love, oh dear. Get out the ice pack, you know, I mean. Lock her up in the room for a while, send her away, because a bad thing has happened. She's become infatuated. At that time, it was preferred that one's marriage was based on careful selection careful organization and approval by both families. And the point I'm trying to get across is that everybody wanted this, not just the parents. 
the individuals, the young people as well, that's what they wanted too. They wanted to find somebody, you know, or be introduced to somebody that would be, <clears throat> excuse me, acceptable to their parents. And you know, they, they, that's what they were looking for. And so the introduction of romance as an art form made it at first an acceptable experience alongside the traditional marriage arrangement procedure and eventually it became the preferred way to go about getting married. Okay, so a little social history there, you know, in five, in five minutes, uh, the history of romance. Well, this happened to the point that now arranged marriages are held as unnatural and rejected by most Western societies. Now, when, I was in, when we were in Montreal uh, working, uh, one of the members uh, in, the, in the church, uh, he was from India and uh, he had an arranged marriage. I remember him telling me he had met his future bride one time when she was like 14 or something like that and he was maybe 16 or 17 years old when he had gone back to India on a vacation and they had written to each other and his parents and her parents you know, thought they would be a good match for each other and, uh, you know, I think about 10 years later, they corresponded from time to time and then with you know, Skype and so on and so forth, they were able to talk to each other and, and eventually they arranged a marriage and uh, he went to India and they got married and he brought the bride back with him and I met her, you know. Now, they told me this story, they had already been married three or four years by now and they had a little baby and they seemed happy and so on, arranged marriage and for him and for them, our way of doing things you know, seemed rather risky. Isn't that risky? You don't know her family, you don't know his family, the parents don't know each other, you don't have a complete history. You know, they found that kind of, kind of risky. Anyways, the point I, I, I want to make here is that the success of a marriage does not depend solely on how carefully you arrange it or how romantic or infatuated that the couple is. You know, for example, Adam and Eve, you know, that was an arranged marriage. So for centuries, arranged marriages succeeded in providing lifetime unions that were satisfying and productive. And for the last couple of centuries, marriages begun with a simple romantic urge have also been able to produce long and successful unions. I'm not arguing for one or the other, I'm just trying to give you the history here. So regardless of how they begin, the marriages that work are the ones that eventually base their relationships on love, not compatibility or romance. Okay? I'm not arguing for compatibility over romance. I'm just saying compatibility or romance is not the key ingredient to making a lasting marriage. Love is the ingredient that creates elastic, a lasting marriage. All right, so let's talk about romance versus love here. I want to make a distinction, you know, like Ann Landers did between romance and love. Every marriage needs romance, you know, a spark, a sparkle, of course. But it can't survive on just one ingredient alone. You, you watch on TV nowadays or maybe more on YouTube or something, you know, guys, the way they propose to their girlfriend, spectacular, you know, a plane is, writes, I love you, will you marry me? Or they're at the, uh, you know, whatever, a big sporting event and uh, the, the guy asks the girl to marry him on the jumbo trunk, you know, something really romantic. Everybody goes, oh, 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 but you know that, oh, oh, oh that doesn't last 40 years. You know what I'm saying? You don't have access to the jumbotron you know, every week, every day. So let's talk about romance and what it does, shall we? First of all, romance produces the wrong expectations. Previously, in older and Eastern cultures, young people were prepared for marriage by preparing themselves for conjugal living. In other words, the the, 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 the woman would uh, begin preparing a dowry. You know what a dowry is? Things that she would bring with her into the marriage. Uh, in those days, linens and dishes and you know, stuff, the stuff that you needed to, 
to prepare a home. Uh, she would be educated. Um, the, uh, both the man and the woman would develop skills for work. Uh, and again, in the, in the older cultures, the woman would prepare to know how to be a homemaker, how to cook, how to care for children, how to manage a home. And the man would uh, you know, learn a skill or get an education. Things have changed in that. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, there was a time when people actually prepared themselves for marriage. And going to the movies on Friday night, this is not preparation for marriage. You understand what I'm saying? People would consciously prepare themselves for marriage. The relationship was allowed to grow within the context of a home and shared commitment to family and the land and so on and so forth. You see, further back, the love was the product of the life together. Okay. Today, we prepare for marriage by looking for and usually idealizing the perfect mate for ourselves. That's how we get ready for marriage. We, we try to think is, who's the right person for me and will I find that person? So people focus on their image and then they look for a matching image. You know, that's, that's why we sell, that's why we have the gap and we have, you know, a hundred different clothing stores for men and women. It's all about the image. And after they have found Mr. or Ms. Wright, they marry and they begin to learn how to live the conjugal life. In other words, nowadays we do it backwards. Before, people would prepare for the conjugal life, okay, and then find the person. Today, we find the person and we learn how to live the conjugal life after we're, after we're married. Okay? So uh, we fall in love and then we learn how to live together. At a different time in history, we lived together and fell in love. So history shows that one method begins with very little emotional investment and grows with knowledge and practice, and the modern method begins with total emotional investment and high expectations and then must adapt to the lesser reality. And that's a kind of a stark awakening. You know, a lot of people in their marriages after a while they go, who are you? <laughs> who are you? You're not the guy I married. And the reason for that is, well, <laughs> you didn't know who you were marrying before, that's the problem. Another problem with romance, it emphasizes the wrong things. Romance looks for the spark, the fire, and it'll often reject a potential partner who is spiritually, emotionally, and socially suitable. Romance's courtship is based mostly on the pursuit of physical intimacy, ignoring more important elements of human relationships. Romance searches for a partner that feels good, looks good, but it ignores issues of character and adaptability and comfort, which make long-term relationships possible. You know, I've counseled with people you know, who aren't married yet, you know, but they're, they're having problems in the relationship. You know, they're dating or maybe they're engaged and the other person's making them miserable. And they're asking me, well, how, you know, how, how can I get over this so we can get married? And I'm thinking, you're still thinking about getting married? You know, I think a lot of pe older people that are in the audience listening to this or li listening to this on, on video, you probably had the experience where you see two people kind of you know, get together and you're saying to yourself, man, that is a train wreck waiting to happen, right? Everybody knows that except who? Except the two individuals on the way to the train wreck. That's what romance does. It, it blinds you, you don't get to see it. Number three, romance does not take advice. Romantic couples feel that they don't need the benefit of counseling, mentoring, or teaching because what they feel is real and what they feel is the major determining factor. It always amazes me that a young woman would spend $2,000 on a dress that she'll wear once 
but will not consider investing $500 into premarital counseling that might guarantee her happiness. I mean, it happens all the time. If people put as much focus on preparing themselves emotionally and spiritually for marriage as they do for the party, no offense, you know what I'm saying. Some people are in the business of doing weddings, you know, which is fine, because it should be a happy and you know, glorious time, of course. But what I'm saying is uh, getting ready emotionally and spiritually, that's also very important. And usually we neglect the one and focus on, on the other. Um, romance doesn't take advice. And in doing this, they miss out on the important marriage preparation while heading for a disaster. And then romance demands perfection. The intensity of romance is caused by the idealistic way that we view our beloved. We're swept up by this fantastic feeling about this person. What happens to the perfection and the intensity of the feeling when it drops, even a little? Because most people who are in love, the thing that's going through their mind is, oh, please let this thing just stay up there. I don't want to see it go down, not even for a moment. Because if it goes down just for a moment, maybe, oh, maybe I'm not really in love. You know, I got to keep that intensity. Romance is not about building something. Romance is about maintaining something and usually maintaining something that's not even real. So when romance slows down or it disappoints or it stops, we look for somebody else to give us that feeling. Uh, that's what's going on in Hollywood. People there have the money, you know what I mean, to kind of create this artificial romantic thing. You know, hey, let's take a plane and let's jet off to Paris or something. They got the money to do that. And when things you know, don't go well and they have to actually work at something, hey, you know, I got the money. My lawyer will send you a letter. I'm just going to call the movers, move my stuff out. I'll go live at the hotel for a couple of, you know. Ordinary people don't have that, that luxury. All right, let's talk about, and hey, I'm not against romance. We'll talk about romance in its positive context here. I'm just showing you that the effect of romance and what it has on the individual while they're going through it. Let's talk about love, shall we? Now there are several emotions, experiences that we all have referred to as love, but the kind of love that is necessary to make a marriage work can be defined as this. It is a commitment to make another's welfare equal to one's own and the self-discipline to back up that commitment. Now that doesn't sound romantic, you know? It, it doesn't sound romantic, but it is the essence of what creates love and maintains love. Notice the components, a commitment to consider another's welfare equal to one's own. This is the highest form of human love, the highest form. When people marry, they make a promise not just to be each other's spouse or never to leave, they promise first to do what? Well, I've done enough weddings, you know, the first thing, you know, uh, you know, taking the vows. I promise to, the first thing is always love. I promise to love. It's not I promise to pick up my socks and underwear laying around. That's not the promise you make. I promise to love. The commitment is to do this whether a person is well or ill, whether we are in good circumstances or bad circumstances. The promise that I'm making is no matter what happens, I am going to love you. Not romantic love you, love you a, com a commitment to consider your welfare equal to mine, that kind of love. You are as important to me as I am to me. That's the commitment I'm making. Whether you remain beautiful or whether you have an accident and lose one of your arms, 
whether we're both working and pulling in a lot of money so we can do stuff, or I lose my job and we have to live off of your set. You know, no matter what, I am, commit, I am committing to love you as much as I, I, love, my, I love myself. You know, in the, uh, this is a very old movie, but there's an old movie called Love Story. Way back when, oh my. Eric Siegel had his character in this movie say, love is never having to say I'm sorry. But a better definition is this, love is not having to watch out for my own welfare because my partner is watching out for my welfare. And my partner will do for me just as good as he or she would do for themselves. The other part of love, self-discipline. We don't promise self-discipline. I never, nobody ever said that in a marriage vow. You know, I put the ring on, I promise to control myself. You know, especially on the wedding night, you know, come on. But I'm telling you, in order to love, you need self-discipline. Nobody can love without self-discipline. You can't do it. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that beautiful passage on love, you know, he says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, love is not rude, love is faithful. Well, I'm telling you, this kind of behavior of love is not possible without cultivating self-control. You can't be patient without self-control. You can't be kind without self-control. Why? Because a lot of times kindness is just putting your hand over your mouth and controlling what you say. Most of the times kindness is not so much what you say, it's what you don't say. That's kindness. And that kind of action requires self-control, controlling our tongue is not arrogant, does not brag, love is not rude. You know, all those virtues that cultivate love require self-control. So the commitment to consider my partner's welfare equal to my own requires me to control my sinful and my selfish impulses. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have to go pick up my wife at 10 p.m. at her mother, she's at her mother's, and I'm over at my buddy and I'm watching the game, whatever game you want to watch, OU, OSU, Bedlam, whatever you know, game you're watching. But it's 9.50, it's going to take me 25 minutes to get over to my mother's or to pick, you know. But now it's 10 to 10 and they're tied, they're going into overtime. Oh. I love her, But I love OU a lot too. You see what I'm saying? Not a huge thing. Am I going to just wait, let her wait? Tap, you know, she's got her coat on, she knows I'm supposed to pick her up at 10. I'm just going to let her wait, tap in her thing. Or am I going to just say, hey, I can pick up the score on the radio, I'm going to go and be there when I said I was going to be there. Self-control. Or another, another example, I, I, I love him, but there's this new guy at work and he's giving me signals and so on and I kind of feel attracted to him. You know, what, what, what do I do? Or I'm tired and she's tired and the baby is crying and it's 3 a.m. You know, psychologists say that some people are unable to love not because they don't feel attracted to other people, but because they lack the self-control to accomplish what love requires, and that is considering another's welfare equal to our own. So marriages that are built on this definition of love, whether they are arranged or whether they are the result of a romantic impulse, will survive, they will grow, because they have the single most important ingredient. And that is a commitment to the other person's welfare equal to the commitment we have to our 
own welfare. What, what does Paul say, by the way? That we should love our wives how? As we love ourselves. So how do we build on love? Love, which is commitment to another's welfare equal to our own, sustained by self-control, that's the basic ingredient, that's the basic building block. And once we have that building block in place, then we begin to add to it in order to give our relationship its unique identity and flavor and its direction. If love is in place, it is a joy to add the other things. It's what growth in marriage is all about. The problem is what we do many times is we try to put compatibility of interest at the center. Oh, you like wrestling? I like wrestling. Who, who would have thought a girl likes wrestling? I love wrestling. Whoa. That becomes, oh, yo, you like to dance the tango? I love the tango. You like to take dance lessons? Me too. We put that at the center. Oh, you like sex? I like sex too. We both like sex. Let's put that at the center. The problem with that kind of scenario is you put those things, you know, comparable interests, if you put that at the center, that will not sustain anything. You can't build anything on top of that. You see what I'm saying? You got to have the right thing at the core. You got to have the right building block. I, I put a circle, you could, you could put bricks, whatever diagram you want. You got to have the right thing at the core in order to en enable a relationship to, to, to grow. In other words, if the right thing's at the core, you can put other things on top of it and it'll hold steady. Not just good things, but bad things too. I, I'm not saying we consciously add bad things, but you and I know, if you people here have been married any length of time, there's always bad things, right? Like, oh yeah, you like to tango? I like to tango. Oh, but you, you kind of like looking at other women tango too? Well, I didn't know that about you. And the bad stuff comes too. And so when we have this disciplined commitment to another's welfare, I won't do anything. You know, somebody says, well, you know, why wouldn't you cheat on your wife, Michael? Well, A, because I love her. You know, but B, I would never do anything to hurt her. I couldn't stand her being hurt because of me. I couldn't stand it. I, it would kill me. If love is in place, it's a joy to add other things. If something else is at the core, it will not support the difficulties of life that are sure to come, and it won't promote growth in other areas. So, it's never too late to take your marriage apart. I'm not talking about divorce here, but I mean re-examine your relationship and then put it back together again with love at the core and then adding the other layers. Because I notice in this class, some people are here because, well, they just, they're always in the auditorium class because this is where they like to be. And others are young married or dating, whatever. And others have been married for quite a while and they just figure, why not? Come and listen to this. It's never too late for those who've been married a long time and it's never too early for those who've just met to understand how to build a relationship, a marriage relationship that will last a lifetime. So what is needed, of course, is a recommitment by each partner to put the other's welfare above themselves. Never too late to do that in any, you've been married one year, five years, 40 years, it doesn't matter. It's never too late to say to ourselves, you know what, from here on in, my goal in my relationship with my husband or my wife is to do those things that <clears throat> place their welfare equal to mine. And to begin asking God to bless us with the spiritual gift of self-control. Galatians 5 tells us about self-control. You cannot love properly without self-control. In other words, I control the things within myself that uh, jeopardize my relationship or that harm my relationship with my partner, whatever that is. And then together begin to ask God to help us go higher in love, to consider our partner's welfare 
just not equal to ours, but actually over ours. Equal to one's welfare, that's the highest in human love. But above one's own welfare, that's Christ's love. That's a higher form of love. When we have this kind of love, now we're starting to love our partner with agape. Mm -hmm. Bible kind of love, spiritual kind of love. And you cannot believe the rewards that come to you in marriage when you get to the point where you're putting the welfare of your partner, how your partner feels and thinks and so on and so forth, above your own. When that happens, then the rewards are great, are great indeed. All right, so that's a little bit of an introductory lesson. Let me just show you uh, some of the lessons coming down the pike in this course. Next week, the currency of love, the way or the method, if you wish, to build in our relationship. Holy sex, part one and two, explains the spiritual nature of human sexuality. The money trap, one of the top three reasons for divorce, money. Some people think, oh, it's adultery. No, it's not, money. How people handle money and how they think about money, one of the greatest causes of stress in marriages. Uh, why Christians divorce? We shouldn't divorce, but we do. So this lesson looks at the reasons why Christian people divorce. Then remarriage and renewal, encouraging, an encouraging lesson for those who have been remarried, thinking of remarrying and so on and so forth. Uh, three lessons on blended families. Why? Because the majority of families that exist today are blended families. My kid, your kid, our kid. Or one of the partners has had a previous marriage with no kids or whatever. But these are blended families, brings unique challenges to the, to the marriage. And we're going to talk about that. And then the last one, keeping your spouse happy. It's what most, it's what we want most. And uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll give you some uh, insight into what the Bible says, believe it or not. The Bible does talk about how do I keep my spouse happy? And we'll talk about that. All right, that's our lesson for this morning. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next week.